Hey everybody, Sawyer here, and I'm here continuing my series of top 5 generational heroes with the 1980s. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar, this is a series where I essentially um, pick 5 characters that are either my favorites or just very influential, you know, influential into the industry, into like becoming like, you know, they're just iconic from that, from a certain time period. Each, each video I basically pick a different, uh, generation decade and I go over it and um, the criteria for this list is essentially that the character had to be created during that gen that decade maybe not um not you know maybe they weren't popular or utilized but they were you know created they were first appeared during that that decade also they have to be um no I think that's actually the main criteria yeah so uh, let me go ahead and start this video with um with my number five pick, the Tick. Now the the 80s and 90s are really interesting because, for the you know from the 30s up until like the 70s, you didn't really have a whole lot of really iconic uh, new characters being created. It was mostly you know you just had your kind of established characters from the Golden Age and then the Silver Age, but in the 80s, you know we saw the rise of like underground comics really popping up like. Other companies besides Marvel and DC are, were starting to put things out, and they were dedicated comic book stores by this point. So you know more stuff was getting out there into the hands of people. So we started to see a lot of new characters popping up. Some lasted, some were, you know some didn't. And in the 90s when, is when you started seeing the you know the creator-owned companies such as Image, and that brought in a lot of influx of new characters too. So I I just found that interesting how that worked. But um, Tick is basically a product of the underground comic era. He was originally created as a he was originally created as a mascot, you know, kind of like a um, you know, just like a symbol for like a chain of underground you know or comic book stores in this I think Boston area maybe or Baltimore area whatever. Um, but yeah, he was originally created just as like a, like a you know like a, like a little comical mascot newsletter character to. Um, in these little newsletters that were sent out to the comic book stores, basically promoting the sales or whatever. But they were really funny because it was basically a parody of you know modern superhero comics at the time. And he eventually kind of had his, he eventually got his own underground comic, which you know underground comics were usually black and white and lower budget paper and stuff. And then he eventually got a Saturday morning cartoon, like I think in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. And he just kept getting different series. Uh, sometimes they don't usually last all that long, like a lot of the TV shows haven't really been super successful, but there's definitely a kind of a cult following for this character. I, he's definitely a fun character. One of the, the thing I really like about the character is he's very, um, he's very much a parody comedy character, you know, like, breaking the fourth wall to a certain extent. Not, not as, not as much as Deadpool. He's not as crazy or, uh, profanic as Deadpool or Hardy Quinn. He's much more, um... He's much more of a noble hero. He, he's uh, he's very, very um, he's very, very kind of like dumb and dim with it. And I just that's what I really love about the character. He's actually incredibly powerful, but he's just so dim with it and like uh, innocent that it's just it's fun to read his, his stories. Next up, we have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was another brainchild of the underground comic movement. Uh, you know, who would have ever thought these characters these characters would have become as, as iconic as they end up being? Um, you know, I'm not a I'm not the hugest Ninja Turtles fan. I I mean I enjoy them. I I've watched the cartoon a lot when I was growing up. You know, reruns and such. And you know I you know I enjoy the uh, some of the newer movies and stuff. And, you know, I definitely don't mind these characters, but I'm not a huge super fan. Like there's a, there's a lot of people that are huge super fans of this franchise, and that's the only reason why this is not as higher on the list because I'm just not a huge fan of it. But I understand how how incredibly iconic they are. And that is why they're on the list at all. Um, but it's interesting to note that the Ninja Turtles are originally a parody story, a parody comic similar to, to Tick. Where Tick is more of a parody of just like superheroes in general, maybe Superman a little bit. Uh, the Teenage Mutant Turtles were more of a like a gimmicky thing where like the, the creators basically took the three big trends or the three big kind of like, yeah, the three base basically the three big trends that were going on in comics. Which were ninjas because of like stuff like Daredevil with a hand. It was really they were really big at the time. Which Daredevil was one of the biggest comics that, at that time. Uh, you had the mutants, which you know of course X Men was was huge during this time period. And then you had 
the teenage aspect, which was taken from like Teen Titans, because Teen Titans was also a very popular, good best-selling title at the time. So they essentially took three concepts from the three biggest uh, comics at the time and just kind of mashed them into this, you know, hybrid, you know, turtle soup of a comic book, and it's um it worked. You know, it became really popular and um it spawned a really really iconic popular cartoon uh lots of video games some live action movies and yeah it's history man like it's just it's pop culture history now so next up on the list we have constantine the original hellraiser himself um this is see, this is just like such a cool cat guys i mean you know we have the chain smoking bad mouth you know british bloke himself such a fun character um he is essentially a, I wouldn't even call him like a, a private eye or anything, but he's essentially a supernatural, like, expert, you know, like, hired hand. He's really, just a really fun character. He originally appeared in Swamp Thing during the 80s, which that particular run of Swamp Thing was really, really iconic in comic book history you know, because of Alan Moore's writing. And, you know, Constantine was added in as kind of like this advisor character who basically, like, Follow, you know, Braun, Swamp Thing around and tried to kind of, you know, get Swamp Thing set up for some big event that was happening. I forget exactly what it was, but, you know, it was a really interesting series. And he was so popular because of his, his his role in that story that he basically got his own series. And, I mean, he was the flagship character for the whole vertical um, imprint of DC where it was essentially their adult, you know, imprint. And, yeah, I mean, he's such, he's just a really fun character. Like, he's... I don't know. It's hard to explain, but he's just this one. He's one of those characters. He's one of those bad boys. You just really like to, you really like to watch. You know, he doesn't follow the rules. He's very, very, you know, blunt to what you know, and actually just straight, straight up rude and mean to a point. And he, um, yeah, he, and he's, he's a superhero. He's a not really a superhero, but he's a hero that's some chain smokes. You don't see that as often, very often at all anymore. So next up, we have Eddie Brock. Venom, the original incarnation of Venom, such a huge character. Not my personal favorite Spider-Man villain, but he is a lot of people's favorite Spider-Man villain, and he, I do enjoy him. He he's definitely he's definitely that he definitely has that title for reasons, good reasons. Um, you know, like he's a, he's a, he's basically a symbiote that was that's Peter found on an alien planet during the Secret Wars storyline. Uh, he he brought the he brought the suit with him back to Earth. It gave him enhanced abilities, but he eventually realized that the suit was symbolic and it was kind of like a parasite trying to latch onto him and not let him go. It was it was changing his emotions, making him more angry and rash. Eventually, Peter was able to get the suit off, but by that point, the suit had like attached to someone else, a fellow a fellow colleague of Peter, and it became Venom. And that was the rest was history, you know. Um, it, and I really wish I could have like seen the general consensus of people's reactions to when they when they first read the the first story with Venom, to see that suit that Spider-Man had been wearing for the last what I think it was almost close to a year he was wearing that suit in the comic books, and all of a sudden it just it it becomes a villain. Oh, you know, I would have loved to seen that. Like that, and that would have been reaction worthy. You know, if we if 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 YouTube reactions were a thing during the 80s, but yeah, like. I would love to have seen that, and I would have also liked to see how people reacted to this artwork. I mean, because Venom is a very, he's very unique, you know, art style for his character. I mean, you know, he's real, he's real big and bulky Spider-Man, but he's black and he's really huge and bulky. He's got the huge monstrous teeth. I mean, the slime and stuff is falling off his mouth. That that right there just kind of, you know, see mets a certain kind of image and invokes a certain kind of, you know, uh, character traits to him that you just instantly see like very very primal kind of you know monstrous you know not and not to mention you know you have um damn what's his name frank mcforman's artwork just really kind of brings the character to life literally and all right now at the very top of our list at number one is the anti-monitor anti-monitor now he's definitely not the most he's well he is the most powerful he's definitely the most powerful but he's not the most um, iconic character on this list by any means but he's definitely like I said the most powerful and he's also you know you could argue that he is the most influential uh, character 
in this whole, you know, in the in the eighties, you know, um, he was originally created um, for a mini series, well, maxi series, as they used to be called back in the day, a twelve issue maxi series called Crisis on Infinite Earths. Maybe you've heard of it. It was, you know, extremely, uh, extremely well received book. Um, very iconic. Lots of crazy stuff. You know, iconic deaths and characters were created for that series and. Uh, it was one of the biggest crossover events ever. It was what basically set the standard for you know for, for large scale company wide crossover events like Civil War and you know and um, Earth X and all you know any basically everything you know. And Anti Monitor is a extremely godlike character um, that's really has he's the ultimate uh, he's the ultimate force of destruction and chaos because he just wants to destroy everything the entire universe multiverse he just wants it dead he just wants to eat, to eat it um and it's it's interesting because this character comes out of the whole concept of this character and the storyline just comes out of the need for dc to a dc to fix some of their plot holes and um continuity issues that they had been that just been getting worse and worse over the years because of their whole multiverse you know, thing they had set up where they were using different versions of the same characters. It had just gotten, you know, they have been doing it for so long and there have been so many different writers and artists using the characters and crossing them over into different worlds and coming up with different reasons for them to be able to cross over. It was getting to a point where it just, there were so many continuity issues. It was so much confusion with newer readers trying to figure out where the, who these characters were and which versions of the characters like which version of Green Arrow was the was the real Green Arrow or the default Green Arrow you know it was just a it was a nightmare for the writers and artists and the creative teams at the time so they created this whole event to basically make things easier to, to give themselves a blank state and just wipe it all away and yeah it worked I mean um and Crisis is also one of those things that stayed intact for a really long time now of course like everything else they started, DC started to bring the multiverse back and they started to bring certain characters that were that were dead or like exiled and during crisis and bring them back. But they didn't do it, but they didn't, they didn't do that for like another 30, 40 years almost. Uh, you know, characters like, you know, characters like Earth 2 Superman and, you know, those characters stayed gone for a really long time. And anti anti monitor was the reason why that, ho that all that existed. I mean... Um, this was a he was an epic villain for an epic story. So yeah, guys, that's my top five generational heroes of characters of the '80s. I should probably retitle that characters, not heroes. But yeah, guys, let me know in the comments what characters that were conceived during the '80s that you feel are in, are your favorites are very very iconic. Let me know. Thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for more videos.